Today, we have with us Dr. Shahar Kabatinsky, who is an associate professor at the Andrew and Erna Witterby Faculty of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Technion, Israel Institute of Technology. Shahar received the BSc degree in Computer Engineering and Applied Physics and an MBA degree in 2009 and 2010 respectively, both from Hebrew University of Jerusalem and the PhD degree in Electrical Engineering from the Technion, Israel Institute of Technology in 2014. From 2006 to 2009, he worked as a circuit designer at Intel. From 2014 and 2015, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford University. Kabatinsky is a member of the Israel Young Academy. He is the head of the Advanced Circuits Research Center at the Technion, chair of the IEEE Circuits and Systems in Israel, and an editor of the Microelectronics Journal and Array. Kavitinsky has received the recipient of, has been the recipient of numerous awards, to name a few, 2021 Norman Seedon Prize for the Academic Excellence, 2020 MDPI Electronics Young Investigator Award, 2019 Wolf Foundation's Krill Prize for Excellence in Scientific Research, 2015 IEEE Gulleriman Card Best Paper Award, 2015 Best Paper of Computer Architecture Letters, and many more. His research, uh, current research interest is focused on circuits and architectures with emerging memory technologies and design of efficient, uh, energy efficient architectures. With these few words, uh, I would now request our Vice Chancellor of GIS University to uh, say a few words about Shahar Kavitinsky. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. Shahar, although we have not met in person, I mean, we have been very much familiar with your works since your PhD times. So in so many occasions, uh, we had the opportunity to to use or have access uh, to your works related to the memory system models like team and v-team, then uh, the logic operations uh, like imply, magic, and so many more than in-memory computing. So you have, you have really motivated a lot of researchers in this part of the globe uh, to pursue cutting-edge research in memory stiff technology, memory stress, and their applications. So means, just like others, I am also very eagerly waiting to hear from you. Thank you very much Thank once again uh, for accepting uh, the offer to deliver the talk. So th thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the kind words and for the invitation. Uh, yeah. Very happy to be here. I will try to share my screen. Um, how do I do that? Okay. Can you see my uh, presentation? Uh, not yet. Yes, now it is visible. Okay, great. So, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, there are, you know, advantages and disadvantages to the pandemic. W one of the advantages is that uh, we, c we can now meet more often, uh, at least virtually, right? One, one of my last trips before the pandemic was to India and I gave uh, two tutorials, one in Delhi in IIT and one in uh, Gandhinagar. But uh, since then I'm, you know, staying at home or at least uh, at, in Israel. So at least uh, we have the option to to have those kind of tutorials instead of uh, traveling. Although, of course, it's much better to see you in person, and I hope that soon we will be able to do that. Um, in the meantime, I, I want to, to talk about uh, processing in memory with memory stores. I know that there will be some overlap uh, with the previous talk, uh, but uh, I will try more to focus on the application side, on the circuits and, and system side, and less on the device side and the theoretical sides. 
Um, before that, I want to say a few words about the place that I'm coming from. So as Kamalika said, I'm from Israel. Um, I don't know how much you know about Israel, but Israel in its size, it's like a loud city in India. Okay, it's like 9 million people. Um, we are not that large, but uh, uh, in terms of uh, technology and scientific uh, advances, Israel is uh, after the Silicon Valley uh, with the highest number of startups, the highest number of patents per capita, um, the number of unicorns, companies that uh, startups that uh, their valuation is more than $1 billion. We have about 80 unicorns today. Uh, just to compare, in the entire European uh, Union, there are 48. So uh, from the startup side and the high-tech side, there are many, many, many advances. And uh, one of the main reasons for that is the Technion, which is the university that I'm coming from. Uh, the, the Technion is in Haifa. That's the main campus. Haifa is the third largest uh, city in Israel. We also have two campuses outside of uh, Haifa. One is in, in New York City, together with Cornell University. It is called Cornell Tech. And the second one is in uh, China. Um, the largest department at the Technion is Electrical and Computer Engineering, the department that I'm coming from. We have around 2,200 uh, students and 60 faculty members. At the university, we have four Nobel Prize winners. And uh, around 70% of the high-tech companies in Israel were founded uh, or and or managed by a Technion alumni, 50% of them came from our department. So there's a big, uh, big connection between the industry and the academia in Israel, and mostly between the electrical and computer engineering and uh, the industry. Any companies, that, any high tech companies that you can imagine is located in Haifa. Um, just uh, recently, uh, Google, for example, opened a new R&D center to do chip design. The second chip design uh, uh, after the TPU is going to be done in Haifa um, based on mostly uh, veterans from Intel and our students. Um, so that's a bit about that. And that's how it looks. Okay, Haifa, we are located uh, near, near the Mediterranean Sea on the Carmel Mountain. Um, the campus is uh, about halfway from the peak of the mountain. So the, there is a great view of the, of the, of the beach. Uh, for my office. Um, so that's about a small introduction to the Technion, but uh, we are coming, we are going to talk uh, more about technical side, uh, and I'm going to talk about memory stores and processing memory, but before that, I want to talk a bit about computer architecture. And as you all know, uh, computers are built uh, roughly this, in the same manner for 75 years, uh, since the early days of computers, the von Neumann architecture that separates the processing and the memory side. So when you want to compute, you need to move the data from the memory into the CPU, process the data, and then bring back the data uh, and store it back to the memory. And this has worked for so many years and uh, developed uh, really in, in a high capacity and high, uh, high pace. And it seems like a, a great uh, approach, but actually, if you look today on uh, computers, there is a big bottleneck, the, um, a severe problem on the data movement side, because now we are limited mostly by the need to move the data. If we look, for example, on a few uh, graphs about that, you can see that the CPU has uh, progressed, the speed of the CPU has progressed almost the same pace as uh, Moore's law. You can see it in the red, in red here, but, um, the ability to move the data between the memory and uh, the CPU, the bandwidth of the data movement, uh, also progressed uh, significantly, about 2x every decade, but uh, it's not even close to the pace uh, that the processing ability was uh, progressed. So there is a big gap between the ability to move the data, the ability to bring the data into the CPU, and the ability to process it. Just to get some uh, proportions about that, uh, for example, Google uh, published a few years ago a paper about that, and they uh, said that in their uh, servers uh, for you know, different search uh, things or Gmail or other applications, 
uh, in some applications, more than 90% of the time is wasted for waiting for the data to come from the memory. So the processor can process, but the data is not ready yet in the processor. So more than 90% of the time, the, the, the processor waits for the data to come. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, something that is very inefficient. And when we talk about energy, the problem, the problem is even much more severe because when we look on the, uh, ener the amount of energy that is required to go to the memory, it is orders of magnitude more than the energy to compute. So you can see here in the table, those are the few results uh, that we generated from, uh, from real hardware, in this case, a 45 nanometer, uh, when I was at Stanford. Um, and you can see that uh, performing addition of two numbers is 0 0.2 uh, picojoule. But uh, bringing the same uh, number, in this case, 16-bit number, from the DRAM, from the memory, is 640 picojoules. So it's like more than 3,500 times more energy to bring the data than to compute it. We want to add two numbers. We need to bring two numbers, compute, perform the addition, and then store the result into the memory. So we need to waste 10,000 more times more energy for the data movement than the computing. Computing is like almost, almost zero comparing to data movement. And the only reason is that because we build the, the, the computers in this uh, separation of the von Neumann architecture, okay? So this is a big problem. It is called the memory wall or the von Neumann bottleneck. Uh, and it is a well, very well-known problem in computer architecture. And now the question is how, how we can uh, solve it or at least alleviate it and make it uh, with much better numbers, right? And not like three orders of magnitude or four orders of magnitude more energy than computing. And at least one of the most attractive approaches is to move the processing into, into the memory. If we will be able to compute in the memory, then we don't need to move the data outside of the memory. And the distances will be uh, much shorter. Things will be much better, right? So this is, uh, it seems like a very straightforward approach. And uh, since it is a straightforward approach, actually it was proposed for the first time in the 70s, in 1970. This is the first paper called A Logic in Memory uh, Computer. You can see it in the references here as the first reference. In the 90s, there were multiple projects about that. Uh, some of them are like active pages, and there was a big uh, project in Berkeley called the Intelligent RAM. Um, and even uh, most recently, there were like a few other approaches on performing computation with uh, DRAM. But most of those approaches were to take the memory and put a small processor close to the memory on the same chip. Uh, so at the end, it was another von Neumann machine, but with a smaller distance between the processor and the memory, and not a completely new uh, paradigm. Uh, so it might reduce the, the, the distance and by that reducing this, the, the energy, for example, from 3,000 times more energy to 200 times more energy. But the main problem wasn't changed. In the end, it is the same problem and uh, it's all about just changing the parameters, values, and not, not, not changing the concept. So I'm not, I'm not going to talk about those approaches. I'm going to talk about something more radical. And the, the thing that is more radical is really to process within the memory using the same cells, the same memory cells, both to store the data and also for computation. And in uh, in order to do that, we need a different technology because we can't do that with DRAM or SRAM. With DRAM and SRAM, we can't use the same cells also for computation, but with memory stores, we can. And I'm going to discuss how we are going to do that and then to uh, present the more, uh, the more architecture and uh, algorithmic aspects of that and understand what, what applications will benefit from that. And I'm going to show two approaches. The first one, uh, and I think that you saw the basic circuits of that in the previous talk, the first one is to use digital computation. The idea is to build logic gates within the memory. So at the end, the way that, the, at least from the mathematical point of view, we are going to do the same 
computation, but the architecture is different. And of course, there are a lot of implications to that, such as uh, the programming model uh, and the control, but it is digital. And the second approach will be to perform it in an analog manner using neuromorphic computing. And then we perform different operations that are more uh, appropriate for uh, artificial intelligence or for deep neural networks. Uh, you can find your own uh, buzzword for that. Uh, so this talk is split into two, uh, two parts. The first part is the memoristic memory processing unit, which is digital computation. And then the second part of the talk will be about accelerating deep neural networks using analog neuromorphic computing. Um, so as I said, the basic technology will be memory stores. I'm not going to discuss all the theoretical aspects and the device things that you saw in the previous talk. I just want to, uh, since I want to make this uh, talk uh, self-contained, I will give some uh, necessary background without going into the deeper, uh, deeper aspects of memory stores. So first, when I say memory stores, I'm talking about resistive memories, okay? Technology that relies on resistive values in order to store the data. And, there are, uh, and this is a theoretical concept, but when we go uh, deep, deeper into the physical side, there are many different technologies that rely on that. Uh, it can be resistive RAM, which is often called also memory store, but it can be also other technologies such as a spin uh, torque uh, transfer magneto resistance RAM, STTM RAM, or phase change memory, PCM, that is often also called today in the uh, industry as a 3D X point or Optane. And as you can see from this slide, many, many, many different companies have these uh, technologies. Uh, some of them are still in the research phase. Some of them already have some products. Um, the only large scale product that exists today is in the phase change memory area era uh, uh, with Intel that are so, uh, selling their, in, uh, their Optane product. And it is very impressive. I mean, it's 1.2 terabytes of memory uh, that is, is being sold, uh, which is faster than flash memory. Okay, so there are existing products, although not widely spread, definitely not standard uh, products, but the, in the embedded memory side, which is comes in the kilo and megabytes, there are much more, uh, both with resistive RAM and STTM RAM, and also some phase change memories. But for the sake of this talk, we just care about the resistive, uh, um, um, the resistive uh, characteristic of the device. So what we need to assume about our memory stores are that there are two terminal devices. They store resistance or the resistance changes according to the applied voltage or current across the device. Um, I will give a, a, some a background about resistive RAM but everything that I'm saying here about resistive RAM can be also applied to the other technologies. And we, are, uh, we have the different uh, techniques to, for other technologies. I will elaborate a bit more about that in the next slides. So basically our assumption is that when we apply current, for example, from left to right here, and you can see here the black thick line, this, this represents polarity, uh, the, the direction of the device. So in this case, the resistance will drop. Okay, so you can see here that for the same voltage, the current increases because the resistance drops. And at the end, it will reach some uh, physical uh, limitation, which is called low resistive uh, state or R on, uh, which is the minimum uh, possible uh, resistance. And if we'll apply current to the other direction, then the resistance will increase. And you can see the same voltage uh, or we increase the voltage magnitude, but at the end, the current uh, almost doesn't change because the resistance is increasing. And again, we have some physical limitation, which is the high resistive state or R off. And if we are not going to apply any voltage or current, then the resistance is retained unchanged. So it's a non-volatile device. When there is no voltage, the value of the resistance is unchanged and we store data uh, in the form of resistance. So it means that it is non-volatile and you can see it from the hysteresis uh, curve here that if we want to understand what is the resistance, we can apply some voltage and measure the current. And if the current is low, it means that we are in the high resistive state. If the current is high, 
it means that we are in the uh, low resistive state because the resistance is low. Um, so that's the basic concept of, uh, of the memory store. Again, different technologies will have some slightly different behavior, but it doesn't matter much for, for, for this talk. Of course, it is uh, very important when we really want to do it in real life. Uh, um, but again, right, we will try to focus more in the higher level of uh, abstraction. And memory stores are very attractive for memory. There are many advantages to memory stores when we want, we want to use them as memories. They are all back end of line of a standard CMOS process. So we can put a three dimensional chip where we have transistors and on top of them, we have layers of memory stores. This was demonstrated multiple times. Uh, and because of that, they are CMOS compatible. Uh, they are extremely dense, okay? The, the size of a memory store is the smallest possible uh, size of, uh, of the CMOS technology because it is basically a cross point between two uh, metals. So it's just a cross point is a memory store. So we can, and we can put an array of, uh, of metal, uh, metal uh, wires. So it is the densest possible memory. Uh, we determine that with F square, so it's for F square. And of course, this is in addition to the fact that we can stack them uh, in layers and then it is even uh, denser. For example, in the Optane that Intel are selling, they have two layers of uh, uh, phase change memories. And in the next uh, generation, they said that they are going to go to four layers. So it is extremely dense memory. It is non-volatile by its definition. It is relatively fast, much faster than flash. Uh, some technologies are faster than DRAM uh, and can go even lo as low as the SRAM. Really depends on the specific technology. The power is relatively low, no static power because of the non-volatility. The endurance, the amount of times that we can program the device before it is not functional physically is relatively high. Again, much higher than flash orders of magnitude better than flash. Um, some technologies, mostly MRAM, can reach uh, also the, the endurance of uh, DRAM and the SRAM. All the others today at least have uh, some, uh, some limited uh, endurance, but again, much higher than what we have in uh, 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 conventional non-volatile memories. And also, since we don't store a charger from the physical side, then it is radiation hard. It means that uh, it is immune to radiation. Uh, and this is very attractive for applications such as space or uh, medical uh, devices. And this is another niche that some of the startups are looking at. So we can build the uh, attractive memories of that. And the basic structure is a crossbar. So the idea is that we have uh, rows and columns and uh, every cross point uh, in the crossbar is a memory store. Uh, and when we want to, First, as a memory, we just want to read and write the data. So when we want to write, we just want to apply a positive or negative uh, voltage across the device that we want to program. So we select a, a device and we put here some uh, positive or negative voltage according to what we want to do. And we ground the word line. And uh, as we saw, it will switch the resistance to the desired uh, value, high or low resistive state. Uh, at least for the digital part, we'll focus only on binary devices, either in the high resistive state or the low resistive state. Uh, but in the analog uh, uh, part, we will see that we can do more than that. Um, and when we want to read the device, all we need to do is to use Ohm's law because we will apply some uh, voltage and we will sense the current and the ratio between the voltage and current is the resistance. And by that we will know whether we are in the high or low resistive state, just note that in practical memory stores, there is a threshold. So it means that we can apply a relatively low voltage and it won't change the value of the resistance. Okay, so this is a, 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 very, good, a, a very good characteristic of physical memory stores that we can decide whether the applied voltage uh, will be sufficiently high to switch the device or we will select some uh, low voltage that will be uh, sufficient to read the device without, without uh, distract uh, the, the value. Uh, this is very important. And it will also use, be used for, for uh, computation. So this is the basic functionality. 
of memories. We can read and write uh, in dense arrays, but we want to pro process inside the memory. And as I said, the idea is to use the same cells, both to store the device and also for the computation. And if we can use the same cells or the same circuit to do both, and the idea is to use the uh, crossbar structure to perform computation, we want to compute inside the crossbar structure. If we are able to do that, then we can dynamically decide if uh, those cells are used for memory storage or for computation. And we can represent it by colors, okay? So you can see here that orange represents a uh, computation, blue represents a uh, data storage, and we can dynamically decide that the memory uh, changes its, uh, its role during the computation. Some parts will be used just to store data. Some parts will be used for computation. We call this new unit not as a memory anymore, but as a memory processing unit, MPU. And this unit really process inside the memory. Um, and there are oh, many I'm ways just to... interrupting once, Shahar, here. Yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, uh, does any of uh, this uh, architecture, this kind of architecture with RAM and all, has been fabricated? Yes. I will show some experimental results. Yes. Okay. Okay. In like three slides. Thanks. Um, so there are many ways to do that. Um, I think that you heard about some of them in the previous talk, so I will just uh, focus on magic, memory store added logic, and explain how it works, and then we'll just assume that it is, uh, it is uh, some uh, black box, uh, that it is uh, our main uh, building block, and we will see how we are going to build uh, architectures from that. Um, basically, a memory store added logic gate uh, is a stateful logic gate. The idea is that the state uh, of the stored data inside the memory store is also the logical value that is being used for computation. In this example, we will see a magic no gate, but I want to emphasize that we have many other gates that we can, uh, we can perform, both in resistive RAM and in other technologies. Uh, so it's not I mean, I know that I, I did that as well uh, during my research that we focused on magic no, but actually we are now moving towards additional gates because we see that some additional gates are actually even better when we go into fabrication and uh, real devices, at least for resistive RAM, and uh, which is, by the way, in, in phase change memory, no gates are excellent for fabrication. Uh, but they have a different structure and a different behavior. Uh, but I will show the magic no example, uh, which is, I think, easy to understand. So the idea is that we have two uh, input memory stores. And the two input memory stores, their initial value, the initial resistance, is the input. So if the uh, initial resistance is in the low resistive state, we call it 1. And if the initial resistance is in the high resistive state, we, we are calling it 0. Two, two states. And prior to the computation, we have those values stored because it is a memory, so there is data stored in the memory. It can be because we computed this value earlier or because we just perform a store operation uh, just in, in, a, in the same manner that we are doing it in a standard memory. At the end of the computation, the final resistance of the output will be the result with the same uh, terminology. Low resistive state is one, high resistive uh, state is zero. Okay, so we start by computing based on the initial values of the resistance of the input, and we end up with a new resistance in the output, which is the result, the output. And the way that we compute is by two steps. First, we initialize the output to a known value, in uh, our case, the low resistive state, the same way that we program a device uh, when we perform a, a, a write operation in the memory. And then we apply a voltage, a positive voltage here in, in VG, and we ground the other node. And then current will flow from the high voltage into ground. And the amount of current that will flow depends on the ratio between the memory stores, between the known values that we initialized and the initial values of the uh, inputs. And this ratio will determine whether the output will switch from low resistive state to high resistive state or will retain its value. And the only thing that, because of the direction, the only thing that can happen 
is that the output will either retain in R1 or will switch to R off. That's the only possible uh, things. So it really depends on the ratio between the inputs and the output. So let's look what happens in the different, uh, different uh, options. In the first option, both inputs are in logical zero, which is high resistive state. And because it is a voltage divider because, uh, between uh, two res uh, three resistors, then here we have the equivalent resistance of two high resistive states, which is R of by divided by two, which is still much higher than R on. So it means that most of the voltage will be across the inputs and effectively at the output, there will be no voltage, which means that also there will be negligible current that won't be sufficient to switch the device. So it will remain in the low resistive state or logical one. The same thing that happens in a NOR gate. In any, uh, of, uh, in any uh, other combination of the inputs, at least one of the inputs will be in the low resistive state. And then the equivalent resistance of the, of the inputs will be low, because even if we have R on and R off uh, in parallel, it is almost R on. So we will have here R on or R on divided by two, depending on the situation. And now when we apply the voltage, at least half of the voltage will be across the output. And we'll select VG in a, a manner that VG divided by two will be sufficient to switch the device. So at the end of the computation, the output will switch to R off, which is logical zero, the same thing that we want in a NOR gate. So we see that we have four input combination, possible combinations, and in any one of, in any uh, combination, we will get at the output the desired value based on the NOR gate. So this is a NOR gate. And not only that it is a, it is a NOR gate, uh, a magic NOR gate, it's not just magic, it is also real. Uh, the same thing that Kamalika asked me. And you can see here several experimental uh, works that, that uh, were done. The uh, two in the top are from KAIST in Korea. A group in uh, two groups in Korea that demonstrated magic no and magic not gates in their devices. In the bottom, you can see here a test chip that we fabricated together with a windbond from Taiwan. And we also uh, demonstrated that on multiple devices from different uh, different vendors, different uh, different collaborators. Here, for example, you can see a paper that we published last year in uh, IEEE transactions on electron de devices, together with uh, Rainer Wasser's group uh, uh, from Aachen in Germany. Uh, and we demonstrated different gates uh, for uh, VCM devices, valence change uh, mechanism, which is similar to the HP's memory stores. Uh, in this case, it was tantalum oxide memory stores, but it's quite similar to uh, HP's original memory store. And we actually saw there that the magic nor uh, has some problems in those devices because of the ratio between the voltages. We, I, I don't want to go into the details. We explained that in the paper and we uh, demonstrated other gates. In this case, you can see here the experimental results for an OR gate, but we demonstrated multiple gates uh, uh, that, that uh, execute uh, different uh, Boolean functions. Uh, it doesn't really matter. I think that then the idea is that we can perform different logic gates using resistance uh, by using memory stores. Okay, so there are many oh, ways. I just that. wanted to ask you one more question here. Mm -hmm. Like how many such gates you have implemented using memory stores? Is it a crossbar structure or is a single gate that you have fabricated? So, so in here it is a small crossbar and we demonstrated a, a, a full header. Uh, okay. That's like the largest uh, implementations that we've done. Uh, okay. We are now working on scaling it up. With Winbond, we actually had a 32 by 32 crossbar, but we had okay. a problem with, with the crossbar, but not because of the logic, even for memory functionality. Um, and uh, we have a, a paper in review for phase change memory uh, logic uh, gates that are also, uh, we are demonstrating their half header. Um, okay. But, but we, we are now working on scaling it up for larger arrays. Um, Thank you. Larger Thank you. eyes are of, course, are, of course, something that even for uh, memory are still uh, something that uh, is challenging, but, uh, but 
again, right, the, the products all that with thousands by thousands of uh, rows and columns. Okay, so we can perform the single gate, uh, but uh, it's not only that we can perform a single gate. If you are looking on, on this uh, single gate that I presented for the magic nor, you can actually see that it is compatible with the cross bar structure. If you just follow the colors, you can see that this gate is actually equivalent to this gate, and this is a row in a cross bar. So we can just perform the same computation by selecting different columns or different bit lines inside the memory in order to perform a no operation. We just need to select two columns with VG and one column with ground, and we will have a magic no gate. But not only that, because of the fact that we are selecting columns, we actually select multiple rows. So at the end, what we are having is multiple gates that are, can be performed in, uh, in parallel. Okay, so it's, it is actually a huge parallel machine that can perform numerous uh, magic no gates because we select the columns and many rows in, in parallel can be executed. In the, and, and if we think about latency, for example, the latency to perform one magic uh, no gate or one million uh, magic no gates is the same. It, is, it doesn't, it's independent on the number of rows that are executed or number of gates that are executed in parallel. And we also able to deselect some of the cells. Um, this can be, a, this is shown in this paper. Uh, although that I will show later, we think that it's better to, to use all the rows uh, simultaneously in order to exploit the, the advantages of the MPU. And um, by that, we can really use the same, the same circuit of the course bar, the same course bar, both to store data and to compute, and not only that, doing it in a huge parallel machine. Okay, so we know how to do a magic NOR inside the memory. NOR, for example, is a complete logic family. It means that we can perform any type of operations that we want using uh, this basic gate. It is, uh, unlike CMOS, in CMOS, if you want to use NORs to perform any computations that you want to do, you need to build a circuit based on NORs, and then you can uh, implement, for example, an adder. In uh, MAGIC, what you need to do is a sequence of NOR operations, one at a time, one step at a time. So if you want to do a, a, an addition, you need to do, in the first step, the first magic NOR gate and the second, the second one. But again, you can do everything that you want. So it's just, uh, we can do any logic or arithmetic operation. And you can see here this uh, hierarchy of operations that can start with a simple uh, logic gates like uh, OR or XOR. And it can go to arithmetic operations such as addition and square root and up to matrix multiplication, convolution, and basically anything that you want. It's just ma a matter of what is the sequence of no operations that you want to do. And with that, we can think about uh, the machine uh, that we want to build. And the machine that we want to build consists of a memoristive memory. It can be not only one array, but it can be multiple arrays. Usually in the memory, we have tens of thousands of arrays. Each one of them as it's, uh, is, a, let's say, 512 by 512. In the opt-in, I think they have uh, 4,000 by 4,000, something like that. And we have those uh, cross bars multiple course bars with their control mechanism. And there is a controller and the controller of the memoristive memory processing unit is a controller that supports the memory operations. It can select rows and columns in order to perform read and write, but it also it can support the computation. So for example, let's assume that we want, for example, to perform an addition of two vectors. So we have the two vectors stored in the memory. You can see them. In a conventional von Neumann machine, what we will do is to read elements from the first vector and we will read elements from the second vector, bring them to the CPU. The CPU will process and the result will be stored in the memory. Let's assume that we want to store it here. And then since we probably can't, can, can't read the entire vector, if it is a large vector, we will do it uh, one at a time, like either one element at a time or multiple elements at a time, but not all the vector. In the memoristic memory processing unit, we will do it in a different way. The controller will know how to perform this addition. So the CPU, as part of the program, 
will send a command or an instruction that says, please add those two vectors. This is their location in terms of addresses. Uh, so you need to uh, add them one to the other. And the result should be, uh, should be stored in this address in the memory. And the controller knows what is the right sequence of uh, no operations that are required in order to perform addition. And let's assume that the sequence takes uh, four cycles or four, four, four no operations. So the first cycle, it will select the right rows and columns in order to perform the first uh, set of uh, no operations. And at the second uh, step, it will perform the second uh, step of uh, no operations that relies both on the results from the previous one and also for new, uh, new uh, inputs. In the third one, it will do, do the third uh, sequence of no operations. And at the end, at the last uh, sequence of no operations, the result will be stored immediately into the memory. We don't need to explicitly write to the memory because the outputs of the last set of uh, no operations will be located in the right place in the memory without the need to explicitly move the data into this location. So we didn't move anything outside of the memory and everything was done in parallel within the memory. It's all a matter of uh, control signals without the need to read the data, to know what is stored inside the memory. Everything is done inside the memory. Okay, so this is uh, very different than conventional processing. So we want to build such a system. Uh, and of course, building such a system requires many different things that need to be considered. Uh, for example, we need to uh, build those uh, circuits, right? Uh, as uh, uh, was, was asked, right? We need to design the circuit, fabricate it, see that it's working, uh, fit a specific physical technology to this the concept. And as I said, right, we saw that with a uh, balance change uh, memory stores, we can perform no operations, but we can perform all operations, for example. But with a, a CBRAM, for example, we can perform no operations. And so we need to design all of that, including the decoders in order to uh, select multiple columns and multiple, uh, multiple rows in this uh, uh, specific manner. We also need to design the controller. The controller is like the brain of the system. It knows how to perform addition uh, based on the specific uh, technology and the specific uh, logic technique. And we also need to uh, define the programming model because the programming model is very different than standard programming model. In standard programming model, we access the memory only for reads and writes. Now we are accessing the memory also for computation. And this is something that at least now uh, seems like something that the programmer should be aware of, or at least the compiler should be aware of. Uh, so we need also to write the software, the uh, relevant software. And we also need to think and explore what are the applications that uh, will benefit from such a system because we need massive parallelism. We need the data to be uh, stored in a specific manner because otherwise we won't have the parallelism that we want. Uh, and not, all, not, not all, all applications have this structure. And we also uh, want it we want the computation to be a relatively short sequence of no operations because let's assume that, for example, we want to multiply two numbers. Multiplying two numbers requires hundreds of no operations. But if we just want to perform a, an X operation, X no operation, for example, which is the basic, uh, uh, the basic uh, element in, uh, in binary neural networks, then X no operations is much, much shorter. It's like three no operations. But Multiplication is hundreds of no operations. So of course the performance will be different for, for different ap applications. What we can benefit from that. So here you can see some results, for example, for image processing. Okay, we, we built a, a memory stiff memory processing unit for image processing. And we uh, took several kernels of uh, image processing and you can see and compare ourselves to uh, different accelerators. One is called the Pinatubo and the other is a uh, APIM. Both of them are using memory stores with uh, some sort of in-memory processing. And so it's uh, much better than von Neumann architecture. And you can see here how much we benefit in terms of throughput in terms of speed. Uh, and you can see it goes from 3x to 270x uh, improvement versus those accelerators. So the performance improvement is enormous. Uh, 
a group from a, a University of California, San Diego took magic and implemented it for deep neural networks uh, for training of floating point operations. Uh, this is a paper that they published in ISCA in 2020, 2019, and they showed different neural networks, like uh, AlexNet and GoogleNet, etc. And they showed versus uh, GPU that they improved the, the performance by around 100x. And uh, with the energy, they also improved it by about 50x, okay? The training of deep neural networks. We are also exploring other applications. Today, we, are, uh, we just submitted uh, two papers recently, one about DNA sequencing and the other one about databases. Uh, both seems like a very attractive applications for a memory state memory processing unit. Uh, for example, in DNA sequencing, our DNA have a, a long sequence. The human genome is 3 billion uh, uh, base pairs, characters. Uh, each base pair consists of one out of four possible uh, characters. So you can uh, represent each element in the DNA using only two bits. So the basic operations are simple logic operations. But on the other hand, we have 3 billion of those that needs to uh, be uh, compared uh, in parallel. So it seems like a very uh, relevant application for the memory memory processing unit. Same for databases. In databases, we have hundreds or thousands of gigabytes, sometimes even more, of data that has a tabular structure, for example, names of people and their ideas and their age. And we want to look for something, for example, for a specific person with this ID. So we need to um, search through a large amount of data, but performing the same operation in a structured, stru in a structured uh, structure. So we can benefit from the parallelism and everything is done inside the memory because it is a very large memory. And so we showed how we uh, substantially reduced the amount of reads in databases by performing filtering and aggregation inside the databases. Uh, so I hope that those papers will be published soon. Let's cross off in the fingers. Okay, so we understand what, are the what is the basic concept of, of the memory memory processing unit and what applications will benefit out of that. I want to focus on one aspect of the many different aspects that I've mentioned that uh, should be explored and which is the controller. So the controller is the brain of the system. It, on the one hand, it supports the regular memory operations such as read and write, but it also needs to support the computation to support the sequence of no operations that are required in order to perform a specific task. Uh, and we wanted to uh, exploit the parallelism, maximize the parallelism that we can. Um, we can build it uh, to optimize different, uh, different aspects such as the latency or the throughput or the area or the energy, it is whatever uh, is our design uh, guidance. Uh, and another thing that is important is that since the memory memory processing unit is a memory, we need to make sure that we also uh, manage our memory. We can't just perform computation ev everywhere we want because there is data there that might uh, also um, exist there for other purposes. Um, so we know that we want to exploit parallelism. In order to exploit parallelism, we need to make sure that our gates are aligned. For example, here in the left side, you can see two gates that are aligned on the same columns. Input one is aligned to the other input one, input two is aligned to the other input two, and the output is aligned to the other output. If we want to perform two gates that are not aligned, then it means that we are not able to uh, perform them in parallel. And then they will require two separate steps, which means that the performance will be lower. So. We want a controller that will exploit the parallelism. So the first thing that we've done was to develop a tool that was called Simple Magic. Simple is synthesis and in-memory mapping of logic execution of magic. And this tool was a, for a general computation. It received an arbitrary function written in a, a, using the ABC synthesis tool. And AB, the ABC synthesis tool is a general tool developed in Berkeley for CMOS logic synthesis. So we uh, forced it to work only with no and not operations. And uh, 
we got a net list of nodes uh, as the functions that we want to explore to, to perform. And then we used an optimizer that optimized the performance. So it found the right uh, sequence of node operations and the right mapping into the memory in order to reduce the latency, to reduce the amount of node operations that, or the sequence, uh, the, the shortest sequence of no operations that is required. Um, so just to understand how it works. So for example, if we want to implement a full header, uh, so a full header can be uh, implemented, for example, with 11 NOR gates. Actually, it can be also implemented with seven logic, uh, with seven NOR gates, but in the paper we demonstrated it with 11, so I will stick to this example. So the optimal sequence of operations is this. At the first step, first we store the data in this manner. We have A here and A here, B here and B here, and the carry-in is uh, stored here. This is the array, okay? The array is, requires 10 rows by five columns. Of course, the array can be much larger, but this is the minimum required area to perform the full header. We can't, uh, at least if we want to optimize latency, this is the optimal size. And then in the first cycle, we need to perform a NOT. NOT is just a one input NO. So, so we either do NO2 no two, no two or NO1, which is NOT. So we perform a NOT operation between the carry in and the result will be stored in the fourth column here. In the second cycle, we'll perform two, uh, two uh, NOT operations, one for A and the other for B and the result will be stored in the eighth row. This is done simultaneously, so we have parallelism of two. And then in the third cycle, we perform two no operations of those two columns, and the result will be stored in the fourth column. And we can have the same sequence. You can see the full sequence here. Uh, and after the 10th cycle, we will perform a, an operation that will store the carry out here and the sum will be stored here. Okay, so this is the optimal solution for this specific uh, uh, task of full header. But, so it works and you can find the tool and the, this tool, uh, the code for this tool is uh, in GitHub and in our website and you can use it and it works uh, well besides two problems. First, it is an optimization problem. And, an and so we are using an, a, a solver for optimization problems, and it is computationally cumbersome. Even relatively simple functions can take you sometimes days to run because it's, it is complicated. Second, uh, I'm not sure that latency for a single operation, this is what benefits from the MPU, and I will elaborate now. Um, and I want to show you how we concluded to this. So we also uh, manually developed the addition, okay? So we, uh, in a different paper, we showed how to perform addition of numbers in a single row. And uh, those two numbers have n bits. And we saw Hello, how to, yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but in, uh, can you go to pre uh, previous slide? Yeah, sure. Uh, sir, if you want to implement some other function, then other, uh, again, we have to decide where to put those inputs. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that is also an optimization problem, means where to put those inputs so that we can perform this parallel operation. Then only yeah, you, you run simple uh, again, and you will, uh, as an input, you'll put a different function and it will find the optimal solution. Oops. Okay, so we wanted to perform an addition and a, a full header. We already saw how we can implement it, uh, but now we limit ourselves to a single row. So we are, using a, a sequence of full headers in order to do that. And the result will be n plus one uh, bits. And this way we'll be able to perform that. And so we propose that you see in this paper. And then the same group from uh, San Diego, they wanted to perform multiplication. Um, and they used a, a sequence of uh, headers the same way that we proposed in order to perform the addition, right? The same way that we are performing a multiplication, uh, you know, in elementary school. And in order to do that and using partial products, they concluded that the amount of devices that are required is this amount. You'd see three N square uh, bits for the partial products and additional 
around 12n square for the sequence of headers, and of course the result is 2n. So even if you take n to be 16, you need 3,700 uh, devices. And of course, if you go to 32 bits, it is quadratic, right? So the numbers are extremely high. And they concluded that we cannot perform multiplication inside a, a memory array, and they tried to do it uh, in, a, in a different manner. And this was in 2017 in the DAC paper. And when we saw that we were pretty uh, depressed in the beginning, because we said, okay, we see that even multiplications are infeasible within an array. Uh, but then we thought about something that is pretty straightforward, but uh, at the time it was a novel, and it was to reuse cells. It means that we don't necessarily have to do, uh, to have a separate memory store in order to perform the next task. But if this memory store was used earlier, but we don't need this memory store anymore, we can perform the computation into this memory store again. So we can reuse a, a, the memory stores, perform a, a single header at a time. And by that, and also a single partial product at a time, because it's an it's a, it's a iterative process. And by that, we can substantially reduce the amount of memory stores that are required. And now, for 16 bits, we, are, we only need uh, 300 devices. So we moved from 3,000 to 300 uh, and uh, into a linear dependency in the, in, the, in the number of bits. So we saw that we can perform even complicated tasks such as multiplication within a single, uh, single row. But not only that, if we think about it again, we saw in the beginning, right, parallelism. The idea, the main benefit of the memory-sieve memory processing unit is not by the performing the multiplication in 100 cycles or 200 cycles. This is not uh, something attractive, right? In CMOS, you can do it in much lower uh, latency. But if you want to do multiplication with a standard von Neumann machines, even great uh, vector machines can perform tens of multiplications in one cycle. But here you can perform millions of uh, uh, multiplications at a time. So even if the latency of a single multiplication will be relatively high, the throughput is the advantage. The parallelism is what we want. Uh, and with this, uh, with this conclusion, we developed a new tool that is called Simpler Magic. Uh, synthesis and in-memory mapping of logic execution for throughput. And the idea, the figure looks the same, but the, 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 the engine is very different. Again, we start with getting a, a netlist based on no and not operation, but now the mapping tool is not an optimizer. It is first, it limits itself to a single row. It can find the right reusing of cells, when to reuse the cells, uh, based on a, a specific physical limitation, like a, a specific limitation on the row size. And another thing that we improved was not solving an optimizer, not using an optimizer, but to use heuristics. We showed that even using heuristics gives us, even if not the optimal solution, it is close enough. So we can, we, we might lose, you know, one or two cycles because it's not the optimal solution, but at the end, because we gain from the parallelism and not from the specific latency, then this, uh, this tool can, be, uh, can run in one second or two seconds, even for complicated functions, and it gives us a good enough result uh, in terms of uh, latency. And so this is what we believe that is the right approach to use, to limit ourselves to a single row and to uh, improve things for throughput. Okay. So what are we working now uh, in this uh, project? Uh, first, as I've men already mentioned, we are focusing on different technologies, uh, mostly uh, doing experimental work. We have a paper under review for uh, phase change memory. We are doing, uh, we have some initial results for CBRAM. CBRAM is also another memory stiff technology. Uh, for STTMM, we had a paper. I'm not that excited about performing uh, magic with the STTM RAM because the ratio between uh, the low and high resistive state in MRAM is relatively low. So I'm not sure how feasible it is uh, with those uh, technologies, but with phase change memory, we have excellent results, experimental results. 
Uh, with CBRAM, we also have very nice results for Magic Nor. Uh, so this is one aspect. Another aspect is reliability. As you all know, memories in general uh, have a lot of problems uh, in terms of reliability. That's why we use error correcting codes, for example, and we already discussed the endurance problem. And so we are developing different error correcting codes for, um, for processing in memory. The error correcting codes are very different than what is used in standard memory, because in standard memory, you perform the encoding during the write and you perform the decoding during the read. When you read, you also read the uh, parity bits and then you detect and uh, fix the problems. In uh, processing memory, you don't read. You don't know what is the values that stored inside the memory. So we use, we update the parity bits and we, uh, we also perform the X operations between the parity bits and the computation during the computation. So we have a paper in DAC, uh, in the upcoming DAC in uh, December uh, with uh, the first uh, technique, but we actually improved it since then by seven orders of magnitude, um, which is amazing. Um, and we will uh, submit a paper about that very soon. So I believe that uh, we will see uh, excellent results for that uh, in the upcoming uh, future. We also work a lot on the programming model and the hardware software interface. Uh, a paper that we recently published called the abstract PIM was to develop a tool that uh, determines what should be the instruction set architecture for processing memory. Uh, we also developed a compiler for databases that gets an SQL code and compiles it into processing in memory instructions. Um, and so this is something that uh, we should further explore. We also work on design methodologies and tools. Um, we will release very soon a tool that will allow um, people not only for, for magic, but also for any other uh, things that they want to do to evaluate things within an array that will determine the right uh, voltages and uh, currents and the different uh, uh, dynamic behavior within an array. And this will, will allow us to have better evaluation of those circuits. And I already talked about the different applications. We are focusing mostly now on databases, DNA sequencing, and neural networks. So just to summarize the first part of the talk, um, there's a huge potential here uh, because memory stores enable non-von Neumann architecture. But the idea here is it is real memory processing. The idea is we use the same cells using the same memory structure both to store the data and to compute. So it's a backward compatible architecture because if we don't want to compute, it is still just a memory. And we can use the processor and the memory without compute, but for the applications that will benefit, we can also compute using the same structure. And we are working on doing uh, the entire uh, abstraction stack from the physical side up to the programming. Uh, and we have a lot of advances as in all of those domains. Uh, so that's the first part. I have another 30 minutes, right, Kamalika? Yes, yes, definitely. Okay. You have good. a lot of time. Good. Yeah. Okay. So I, I will have enough time to talk about the second thing as well. Very good. Um, the second, uh, so this was digital computation. The second part will be about analog computation focused on deep neural networks. Um, so I guess you are familiar with deep neural networks in general. I will just give a short background about that. And then we'll talk about the aspects of, of the bottlenecks in computation. The basic idea, we have a, a, a lot of layers of uh, neural networks. Um, and there are two, two uh, phases. One is the feed forward that is used either for the inference than when the weights are fixed and we just want to get the result. And uh, we also use the feed forward when we train because we want to know what is the result and then we need to update. So we go one layer at a time, perform a, a, some convolutional tasks or fully connected. And we also, also have things like pooling. Um, and then we get a result. If we are doing training, then we get a result and compare it to the real result, like the, true, the ground truth. For example, we put a, 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 a picture and if we got a, 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 the result that it is a dog, but the original 
picture was a cat, then it is an error, and we determine the error uh, 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 quantitatively. We give a number for the error, and then we backward, we perform back propagation and fixing the weights uh, according to some algorithm. And this is called back propagation. And so this is well known, and there is a lot of research on that um, um, about how to perform the algorithms, how to build the ne neural network, like what is the architecture of the neural network, how many layers, what size of each one of them, etc. How many channels, different aspects of that. And when we look at that, we can uh, understand a few things. So here, what we see in this graph is different uh, well-known uh, neural networks, topologies, uh, GoogleNet and ResNet and uh, VGG, many different well-known uh, uh, neural networks. And what we can see here in the y-axis is their accuracy for ImageNet. ImageNet is a well-known benchmark that has uh, 1 million uh, images, and, and the algorithm needs to predict what is inside the, the image, like a car or a cow and those, those kind of things. And the y-axis gives us what is the top one accuracy, uh, because they can give you like five, five uh, uh, possible results. So whether they predicted the right result in the top one uh, uh, assumption, and we can see that it's uh, like the top ones get like 80% uh, accuracy. And also what we see in the uh, x-axis is how many op uh, computational operations are required, mostly multiply and accumulate. The basic operations are multiply and accumulate because we perform matrix vector multiplications. And uh, you can see it goes into the giga operations, like billions of operations. And each uh, network is represented by a circle. The diameter of the circle is how many parameters, how many weights this uh, model has. And we can see it goes into the tens or hundred, a, few half, a few hundreds of millions of weights. The weights are numbers, that, uh, the, those are the outcome of the training. The outcome of the training is the weights inside each layer. So it's in the tens of uh, millions of uh, weights. So if we try to understand what is the hardware impl implication of, uh, of this, uh, these numbers, we can see that we have millions of different weights and we have billions of calculations, mostly multiply and accumulate. And the weights, the calculations are done usually in a CPU, right? We need to put for multiplications and additions. And the weights are stored in the memory. This is like in a ba basic uh, von Neumann architecture. And by the way, it doesn't matter if we talk about CPU or GPU, which is like the state of the art hardware that is used today. Uh, you just need to replace the C with G and it's the same thing. Um, and again, we have the memory wall problem. We need to perform a lot of computation on a large amount of data, and uh, we can't really reuse the data too much, so we need to move the data all the time. And this is a major bottleneck, okay? And this is implies both to the inference and also for the training. Um, and again, now memory stores will come to the rescue. Um, when we want to do inference, the basic idea is to use a uh, memory stores to store the weights and we perf will perform in an analog manner the computation just to, to understand that the basic operation in neural networks is matrix vector multiplication. And uh, I will show uh, in next how to perform matrix uh, vector multiplication with memory stores, but this is uh, done uh, for inference, we have fixed weights. We don't need to update the weights. So the resistance will be the weight. The data that is stored inside the memory stores will be the weight. And we will perform the matrix factor multiplication. And in order to uh, store a lot of memory, a lot of data, we will use the analog nature of the resistance because in the previous part, we talked about hour on and hour off, but actually it is continuous. So we can also have multi-level cells in order to store more than a single bit inside an uh, inside the array or inside the memory cell. Uh, just to, uh, note that in neural networks, the precision, the amount of bits that are used to store numbers are, is very important. In training, usually the, it is 32 bits. 
In inference, it is around eight bits. So how would, are we going to perform the matrix vector multiplication? Okay, we have a, matri a vector it represented here as A, we call it activations, and a, a matrix called W, which is stored to different weights, and we want to multiply it, uh, to multiply it. So we will represent the weights as resistance. Each, uh, each memory store will store its weight, assuming that we can perform it in a single memory store, but even if not, uh, there are tricks to, to do it in multiple memory stores. So usually it's easier to think about that in terms of uh, conductance um, and not resistance. Conductance is just one over the resistance. So let's assume that we can store multiple resistance values and we can store multiple bits inside the memory store. And the activation vector, the input vector, will be voltages across the uh, columns. So each element in the vector will be, an, uh, will be a, a voltage across the uh, column. And the result will be current, current uh, that uh, flows in the row of each one of them. And we will use Kirchhoff laws and the uh, Ohm's laws in order to perform the computation. So if we apply voltages on the columns and we have resistances on the weights, then the column of each row is an accumulation of the currents in every element, in every memory store, and the current that flows inside every memory store depends on the activation and the resistance of uh, each, uh, each memory store according to Ohm's law. So basically what we have and again, we, that's why it's easier to think about conductances because then it is a multiplication of the voltage and the conductance. Then we have a multiplication of the weight and the voltage. And then it is accumulated because of Kirchhoff law. Then in every row, we have one element in the uh, output vector. So the current represents the uh, multiply accumulate operation of each row. And not only that, since we just apply voltages and sense the currents, then it is done in one cycle. So we can perform n square, assuming that this array is n by n, n square multiply accumulate operations in one cycle. If we, are, if we want to do n, n square multiply accumulate operations in a CPU, it will require n square cycles. So this is an amazing parallel machine that can perform matrix vector multiplication in one cycle. You can do better than that, right? Um, and now comes to the, we need to think about the details. For example, how we are going to represent the data because it's not necessarily possible to do everything really in an analog manner. Maybe we, we can go as low as uh, one bit per, per, per memory store or we can perform it with multiple bits in the memory store but definitely there is a limitation because we have signal to noise ratio at the end. So we can't just you know, assume that the precision is uh, infinite. And so there are many works on that. Some of them assume binary devices. Some of them assume a fixed amount of uh, bits. Some of them assume a complete analog device, but uh, uh, we need, then you need to compensate on noise and the uh, different uh, problems that exist. Uh, and the same goes to the activation uh, voltage. Um, it doesn't really matter much. There are a lot of new tricks in order to do that. If you have limited precision in the memory store, then you might need uh, externally to perform shift, shift uh, operations in order to go to the right precisions that you want. I don't want to go into the details, but it's, it's all new uh, things that need to be considered. So this is for the inference or for the feed forward. When we want to do training, then we also need to support the backward propagation, right? Because we entered as an input an image and we predicted something that is wrong. In this case, the image showed two, but the prediction was seven. Then we need to back propagate something that updates all the weights to a different value in order to improve the accuracy based on some algorithm. So we need now to program all the memory stores and change the weights in an efficient manner in order to increase the accuracy. Uh, and there are different ways to do that. Uh, the most naive one is to 
compute the algorithm externally, the same way that we are doing today, either by software or by still dedicated circuit that computes the, the, the desired the updates. And then we can even go one by one and update uh, the value of the memory store. This is the most naive one, the most naive approach, but of course it takes an enormous amount of time because now we need to program all the memory stores according to some external uh, computation. Another thing that is possible is to really do it inside the memory. And this is something that we first proposed in this paper. Um, the idea was to perform both the backpropagation and the weight update inside the memory. So first the backpropagation itself is quite easy. Uh, since everything is symmetrical in, uh, in the crossbar, then we just need to apply the voltages in the rows and to sense the currents in the, in the columns, and then we can perform the backpropagation itself. But the more uh, complicated thing is to perform the weight update. Uh, so we need to uh, execute the algorithm, the weight update algorithm, and we also want to uh, do it in, in a precise way. So the most basic uh, algorithm is gradient descent. The idea is to, is to compute the gradient of the error function. And then based on that, we need to update. So uh, usually by multiplication between the error and the, and the input. Okay, so we need to determine the error and then to, uh, and the input is known. And, the and perform the multiplication between of them. What, what it means is that if, for example, we have a larger error, it means that we need to update the weight in a larger manner, which makes sense, right? If the error is large, we want to make a bigger step in the weight update because it means that the weight is not updated enough. And uh, if we want, uh, for example, to... Uh, if the input is higher, it means that we give him more, more strength, so we also update it in an higher manner. So what we want to do is to uh, build a circuit that will exploit, uh, will execute this algorithm exactly, but we can do it with a crossbar, okay? Uh, just a basic crossbar structure doesn't support that. So what we are doing, I lost my mouse. So what we are doing is we modify the crossbar structure uh, and we add two transistors per memory store. So you can see here the circuit, we have two transistors and a single memory store in every memory cell. And uh, the way that we are doing it is we transfer voltages into both voltage and duration. So we apply vo a, a pulse, but when the error is larger, then the time that we apply the pulse is, is also longer. And then we update the, the weight further. And also uh, the magnitude uh, of the of the magnitude uh, can be uh, tuned. And of course, also the direction. So if we have a negative uh, error, for example, then we will apply a negative voltage across the memory store. And this is why we need two transistors. One supports positive updates and the, the, the second one supports negative updates. So this is for stochastic gradient, yes. Sir, uh, yes. I have a doubt. Those weight updates needs to be done one by one or uh, there is a possibility? No, in parallel. Can... They can perform in, they can be performed in parallel. The, this is the idea, right? We have the same Y for all row and Obviously. they always go uh, separately. So, so the idea is to update them uh, uh, in parallel. In order so to let us see for uh, with W W one that needs to be changed by one unit and W two one needs to be changed by two unit. So how it can be done parallelly? What do you mean by two unit? Means let us say, sir, uh, we want to change that um, resistance of this memory store W one one by let us say hundred ohms, and for W two one we want to change by two hundred ohms. Then how it can yeah. be done? Input. Exactly. So, so we, we have a multiplication of the input and the error, right? And the error is the same error for all, uh, for all rows, and uh, the input is the same for all columns, for example, okay? Then it okay. means that we can, for a specific cell, it is a cross point of row and column for one input and one, uh, one error, 
and its its neighbors have as the same name uh, the same error but a different input okay so each one of them gets its own uh, specific pulse in parallel okay thank okay? you sir in, in the paper we show the, the entire array and you can see how it how it maps in terms of parallelism okay okay so the idea is to do it in parallel of course um Okay, so this was for uh, stochastic gradient descent. We also support a uh, more complicated uh, algorithms. For example, uh, stochastic gradient descent with momentum. Uh, the idea with momentum is that we also remember the previous updates. Um, so we need some additional memory to remember the previous updates and not only the specific error and that's it. And uh, we also build circuits to support that. And of course, this further increase the memory cell or the, or the circuits uh, in general. I won't go into the, all the details because we don't have enough time for that. Uh, you can see the, pipe, the paper that uh, is mentioned below in TICAS-1 uh, that we showed uh, both the, the uh, theoretical aspects of that and the circuit design. Uh, but the basic idea is to add additional memory in order to store the history of the updates. And we showed uh, two approaches. One was um, to store limited history, which is different than the original algorithm because in the original algorithm, it's the entire history. Uh, but the idea of a limited history is that it's hardware friendly because we don't need to store everything. Um, and the, addition, the second approach was to store, based on the original algorithm, the entire history, but then it requires a further modification to the, to the memory cell. And we implemented both. Uh, we actually showed that the modified algorithm also works well. It's accurate enough. Uh, so it's hardware friendly and accurate enough, although it's different than the software implementation. Um, and we also implemented the full history. Um, and I will skip the details of that. Uh, if you're interested, uh, it's all in the paper, but uh, we received excellent results. Uh, I will skip to the results. Okay, you can see here uh, for MNIST, for example, for digit recognition, that in a blue, you can see the software implementation running on the GPU in the standard manner. On, uh, in blue, you can see the one approach and in yellow, the other approach. And you can see that in terms of accuracy, the results are very similar to the original uh, software implementation, which is like the most accurate possible uh, implementation. But in terms of speed up, in terms of performance, we compared our results to GPU, and we can see that you can see that we improved by two to three orders of magnitude the speed, because we have a large amount of parallelism and everything is done inside the memory. Uh, without the need to move the data between the memory and the GPU in that case, to so improve by 300 to 900 times uh, the, the speed of the training. And this is crucial because training today can take weeks, uh, days to weeks uh, for, for large networks. So if we improve it by 100x, this is important. It's moving from days to, uh, to minutes or to several hours. It's very important. Um, so that's about how to support training with memory stores. Of course, there are many challenges, both on the technology side, uh, making memory stores more reliable, making a memory store more precise because we want to store more than a single bit inside the memory store uh, in order to make the arrays or the networks larger. Uh, when we train, endurance is a limitation because if we have millions of samples, then for each sample, we need to update the weight, or at least for each batch. And uh, this requires a lot of writes into the memory store um, before it is even functional for inference. Um, in terms of the architecture, there are a lot of uh, challenges there on how to utilize the hardware, how to make sure that, uh, um, that uh, for example, the transition between analog computation into the digital result uh, is, is not becoming the hover overhead. Today, uh, the ADCs and DACs, the analog to digital converters and digital to analog converters became dominant in terms of power, in terms of uh, area, 
Uh, so this is another big challenge. Um, and this is a, a whole new field that is, is widely explored and uh, there are many challenges there and a lot of opportunities here. Uh, so what are we focusing now on this uh, domain? We are working on low precision networks, uh, networks with only binary uh, weights and binary end inputs or ternary like minus one, zero and one. Uh, we are developing algorithms. We have a paper that I hope that will be published very soon about how to perform training with binary neural networks using a, a stochastic uh, a behavior of memory stores. Uh, so it, it is both developing an algorithm for training and the right circuit in order to perform the training for binary neural networks. We work on programmable accelerators that support multiple uh, networks. We work on neuromorphic data converters you can see the circuit here of an analog to digital converter, in this case, four bit uh, analog to digital converter that is based on neuromorphic computing. Uh, we have multiple papers about that. Uh, we also work on different non deep neural, deep neural network uh, uh, architectures such as spiking, uh, deep leaf networks, and a new project that we recently got uh, with uh, some uh, collaborators in Europe. It's a large project uh, by the European Union, is a uh, using stem cells in order to build neuromorphic systems. So the idea is not to use memory stores and transistors, but to use stem cells in order to perform the computation. One last thing that I want to mention is that uh, there are many memory stores out there. One attractive technology that we are exploring is a commercial technology. Together with TowerJazz, TowerJazz is, is a foundry. It's a large company based in Israel but as a founder is also in Japan, they acquired the Panasonic foundries a few years ago, and also in the US by acquiring a company called Jazz. And we are working with them using the flash technology, they have flash memories, and we demonstrated, and we had a paper last year in Nature Electronics about that. We showed how we can take their flash technology and make it into a memory store. And this is done using a conventional a commercial process. Actually, it is a, an old technology, 180 nanometers, so it's also very, uh, very uh, cheap. And not only that it is an, a memory store, it is actually an excellent memory store for neuromorphic applications because, because we showed that we can have more than 65 distinguishable uh, resistance levels. So we can store uh, uh, with high precision a weight in a neuromorphic uh, structure. We recently taped out a chip with them, um, an additional one in addition to the one that we published uh, with, uh, in, in uh, Nature Electronics. And now we are going to demonstrate dip different uh, uh, neuromorphic circuits based on this technology. Um, and the advantage of this technology, it's, it's completely seamless compatible. Um, and again, uh, extremely reliable because it's an old uh, technology. Uh, so, just to summarize my talk, we saw that memory stores enable non von Neumann architectures. The idea is that we are using a new technology, and this allows us to think about new architectures that are very different than the von Neumann architecture. And we saw in two parts, uh, two approaches. One was real digital processing in memory using magic gates, and the second one was to use them for deep neural networks uh, using analog computation. And uh, with that, I want to thank again for inviting me and uh, for you for listening. This is my group and the different uh, agencies and companies that uh, fund our research. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shar, for taking us through this journey of Memristor with various fascinating applications and to see that, that everything is coming to reality. So thank you very much. So we want our participant to ask questions now. Yes, please. You, you are muted. Yeah, sorry, sir. Can you hear me now? Thank you for the wonderful yes. talk, Shahar. So I just want to ask uh, regarding the sneak part, which you have not covered. So uh, some researchers have used, uh, in fact, sneak park to compute simple Boolean function. Can this be extended to uh, the computation that we have seen for the deep neural network? 
So, so in deep neural network or in neomorphic computation, actually you don't have sneak path because you select all cells. Since you select all rows and all columns, then you don't have sneak path there. Everything is selected. Oh. Okay. So we need a but more if, control. If you select in some, but if you select some part of the, of the array, for example, let's assume that your layer doesn't fit well into a single array, then you might have sneak path, but actually, at least with the Y flash, we saw that we can compensate on that. Okay, just a follow up question. Uh, are there any sneak path in the Y flash uh, membrane? Not too much. Uh, so it's, it's extremely non linear, so there is not too much uh, sneak path. It's negligible, at least for the arrays that we use. Okay, thank but you. Char, thank I have a related question. I guess I have a related question. Actually, in a neuromorphic array, so as you are saying that there cannot be any sneak path because you are applying voltages uh, to all the rows. But can't there be some reverse current flowing through some of uh, the some of the memory stress, depending on the input voltages that you are applying? Um, no, the, the, because since you apply on all rows, you apply, really apply, then you. The direction is only through, you know, you have ground on the rows because you want to sense currents. Then, then the direction is a, you either will have current or you want you will have low current, but it's all in the same direction. So like what I'm saying, suppose A1, A2, A3 were the input. Suppose A1 is much larger than A2. So can't there be any path from where current can flow from A1 to A2 via through? Uh, no, system? because you have ground also. Everything is positive, okay. so you have ground in the in the sense okay. amplifier. Okay. Because of the sense amplifiers. Any other questions? Um, I'd like to ask a question. This is Shushmita as well here. Hi. Hello, Shar. An excellent talk. Uh, uh, so, uh, because of the variability and other uh, things, uh, what about having fault tolerant designs for these? You know, especially for the uh, advanced applications that you've been working on? I think that fault tolerance design is, is something very important. I don't think it is, was uh, researched too, too much. As I said, in terms of reliability, we started to explore different aspects of that, but there is a lot to, to do there, definitely. Thank you, thank you. Yes, please, next question. Uh, hi, Sayer. Uh, this is Manok from ISI Kolkata. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk. So uh, my question is, while designing uh, PIM, uh, complex peripheral controlling uh, network is using. So is there any uh, directions or any roadmap that what will be the preferable uh, size or area of the peripheral networks in comparison to the crossbar area or in terms of cost, area or power? So it's it's an excellent uh, question because it's a very important uh, issue. M my short answer is it will be as low as possible, right? But um, I don't have a fixed answer. So it's important to know that even in standard memories, the peripheral circuit sometimes goes up to 50% of the area and the power. So so in, we start with a bad uh, starting point, right? But uh, I think that at least I for magic, at least for magic. I have an echo. I have an echo. Um, at least um, for magic, least maybe for magic, you should maybe mute. mute. Manav, can Manav, you please can mute, you mute your screen? Yeah, OK, yeah. good. Um, so I think that for at least for magic, uh, the controllers that we designed so far, uh, I mean, the, addition, uh, the additional functionality for processing is not that high. Uh, and also in terms of the peripheral circuits, but um, this is something still that of course, we, we need to make sure that it's not it's not becoming you know the real issue in neuromorphic computing. It was shown already that it it becomes the the bottleneck. The mostly the analog to digital converters be, uh, became the bottleneck, and this is something that there's many ways to to tackle that. For example, there's the the Stanford approach that to reduce the precision to move to one or two bits, and uh, by that the uh, ADCs become small, but then you lose accuracy. So it's all a trade-off. Any other questions? Thank you. Any other questions? 
yeah, Shah, uh, this is Shoykot here from JS University. Yeah. Uh, fantastic talk. I've really enjoyed this one. I have a question uh, regarding the imaging. As you know that uh, the Nikon and Canon, uh, Bike Lander, as well as uh, uh, the other companies, camera companies, those were there like uh, Hasselblad, Mamaya. Uh, they are developing a stack CMOS image-based sensors. Is it possible uh, that uh, the CMOS and Memristor have got a hybrid integrated pixel sensors and that can be substrate coupling with the MyCMOS technology to get a great output in the imaging technology? So actually, this is something that we thought of and we are looking at uh, because I think that for neuromorphic applications, it, it might make sense. Um, mostly with like the analog to digital converters based on neuromorphic computing, for example, that's what we thought. We had some discussions with uh, Samsung, for example, about that. Uh, it seems like there is a case here, uh, but again, you know, God is in the details. But, but thank you. Like, conceptually, thank you, it's true. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if there is no other question, I would like to ask a couple of questions. So sure. when we are talking about neuromorphic computing, memory stores, and all these things, so there is a lot of device to device uh, variability of these devices. And also like when you, when you do it in a crossbar, size also matters, right? Uh, for uh, this deep neural network, we need huge size memory store crossbars. And to the best of my knowledge, I mean, people have fabricated smaller size, still they have some issues with that. So scalability, what do you think that how long will it take for the device to mature and then we have a reliable, you know, uh, large scale memory store arrays? So, so your, your comments are completely true. Uh, of course, reliability, variation, scalability are still an issue. Uh, just just to, to understand, I said that there is one large scale product, uh, Optane, but the rumors are that Intel lo are losing money about that because the yield is too low. So they need to throw away too many chips because they're not functioning when they fabricate them. Um, but I want, I also, I heard in the, the questions for the previous talk about that, that about commercialization and what will happen because it, it started in 2008-ish and uh, it is still not, not, not standard. And um, I heard a couple of years ago, we, we had a, a conference about memory stores and the last talk of the conference was given by Boaz Eitan. Boaz is one of the, he is the founder of a company uh, called the Saifan that was acquired. Then it was one of the first flash companies in the eighties. And he talked about flash. He didn't talk about memory store, but it was like the open, the closing session because we wanted a talk about showing what takes a, a new technology to uh, to emerge and become uh, commercial. And he talked about how Flash started at the end of the A70s. I mean, my, my PhD advisor in, graduated, I think, in 76. And his PhD was about Flash or floating gate transistors. And uh, then he moved to Intel and he worked for several years about what later be became Flash. And Flash technology was developed in the end of 70s, beginning of 80s, but it became really widely used in 2000 uh, and something. So it took more than 20 years to make a technology that was working in labs and make it something that we put in a, first in the beginning it was in the USB stick and then became, you know, uh, now it is used in, in mobile phones and in laptops. We all use them as SSDs. Even five, six years ago, SSDs with flash were extremely expensive and unreliable. But now this is what is the standard for, for laptops. So new technologies, uh, it takes a lot of time for them to, uh, uh, to become, you know, something mature and stable. Uh, so if we talk about 10, 12 years uh, since the first Nature paper, uh, so I, th we are, I think we are still in the beginning. Okay, so we, we, I think we can be optimistic, although, I mean, there were many technologies in the past that didn't emerge at the end and they, they just, you know, didn't become standards. But, uh, but there, is a, there is a case here, I think. So we are very hopeful that this technology will do something good in near future, definitely, because it has shown its potential in this uh, 13 years or so. 
So hopefully. I think that there is a consensus in industry that uh, th there is a case for resistive memories. Uh, I think the debate is uh, whether it when it will be commercial uh, or economical. Like in, how companies they attend, they don't want a good technology, they want a technology that will give them a profit. And uh, so the debate is, uh, for example, the debate about Optane is whether it's the right time to have uh, such, a, such a memory, whether it can be prof profitable in the near future. Uh, so Intel and one last question. Is... Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, please. So the same that Intel believes it is, and Western Digital doesn't believe that it's the right time. So they have the similar technology, but they don't sell it yet. But right, right, right. I think there is a case. Uh, just, just one thing that this in-memory concept that MPU that you have mentioned. So that will it come as a coprocessor? Do you think that will be the ideal thing, or uh, I mean, replacing the whole of the memory unit with the entire thing? Probably. Like, what do you think? So uh, the holy grail is that it will be a memory that com that computes. But I think that. Uh, a more uh, near-term uh, target is to have it as, a, as an accelerator. That is like okay. it's an accelerator okay. that is based on the memory technology. Right. Thank you so much for answering all of us queries because we were waiting for this talk from day one when we will be asking you a lot of queries because you have a lot of experience of industry and academia, so you can answer us uh, in a much better way. Okay, now I would request our head of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, GIS University, to present this uh, uh, memento. So, am I audible, Shahar? Yes, you are. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving your wonderful session. It's a kind of industry and academia collaboration. And you people are doing fantastic jobs. And uh, coming the days, we are also waiting for the new technology which will come. Now laptops as well as the desktops, even in the imaging technology also. So very small appreciation and regards uh, from the JS University School of Engineering to you. Please accept this. Thank you very much. And uh, a small digital e-memento for you. I hope in near future, definitely we'll keep in touch with you. And as soon as the pandemic will be over, uh, definitely uh, we would like to call you or we'd like to invite you to visit our university. So thank you so much. It's over to Dr. Dutta. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Maiti, for this. Shahar, once again, I thank you so much for uh, spending this time with us. With such a short notice, you agreed and gave us a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And one last comment. I would uh, look forward to Shahar to have some collaborative works with us, our groups in the future. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So we end this session today with uh, this talk. And we will be meeting again at uh, 2.30 for the final talk by Shubham Shahai from IIT Kanpur. Thank you. <laughs>